Hello everyone and welcome to Food Tank's webinar series. This is Sarah Small. I'm Food Tank's Global Events Director. And I'm really excited about today's webinar with Dr. Robert Graham. He's a board certified physician of internal and integrative medicine. Dr. Graham completed his residency in internal medicine at Lenox Hospital in New York City, where he also started his farm to bedside table program with an educational rooftop garden called Victory Greens. Today his presentation will explain how we can use our food as medicine, and he will talk about what, we, what he is doing to teach other doctors about incorporating healthy lifestyle choices into their medicinal practices. This webinar will be recorded and posted on foodtank.com afterwards, and you can follow along and participate on Twitter using hashtag foodtank. Also, please submit your questions using the questions tab in the control panel. You can also email them to me, sarah at foodtank.com, or send them on, twi on Twitter. So without further ado, Dr. Graham, it's really wonderful to have you here, uh, and I'm excited to hear your presentation, so I will give you the floor now. Well, thank you, Sarah, and the entire Food Tank team, and especially Danielle, for allowing me the opportunity and privilege of sharing my thoughts with all of you today. So in the next 30 minutes, what I hope to accomplish is a couple of things. I'd like to share with all of you that food is the root cause of malnutrition and chronic diseases, which is impeding our growth as a nation. Secondly, to describe how doctors, I believe, must step up to the plate and into the garden and begin cooking, counseling, and prescribing whole food, plant-based diets. The more vegetables we eat, the longer we live. And finally, I like to explain how we can use food as medicine at all levels of healthcare, even our hospitals. So I just showed this quote here from Swami Ramananda, and this was as part of an introduction on yoga in medicine program that we co-sponsored here at Lenox Hill Hospital with the Integral Yoga Institute. And I thought it captured really, um, in his own words, that I'm the only doctor he knows who will tell you what to eat to be healthy. I like to prescribe food, and I'll show you in a couple of slides that, how to cook it and how to grow it. So let's have some fun and let's start. So a good farmer once said to me that if the leaves and fruit of a tree look sick, don't spend time looking at the leaves and fruit. Instead, examine your roots. As you can see here, this is a tomato plant that part of it looks healthy and part of it doesn't. So instead of spending our time looking at the leaves and fruit, Let's go dig deeper and examine the roots. You know, a, sorry for that. A tree's health depends on the quality and depth of its roots. It's helpful to think of our own health in this way. We're composed of a complex root system that depends on our culture, our community, our environment, and our nutrients. Sorry for the sounds of the fire trucks, but I'm in Manhattan, New York City, so that's what you're hearing. Sadly, today, the root problem in our society is our food and our connection to it. It's the root cause of our chronic disease epidemic. Come to think of it, as other TEDx leaders and thought leaders have said, food is not only the problem, but I believe, as they do, it's also the solution. See, much of healthcare today operates in a reductionist model a pill for an ill. This model simply does not work for these. Our web of chronic diseases. As you can see, sorry, as you can see, these are the top four chronic diseases that we are currently facing in healthcare today. And I'd like to make a special attention to diet. You see, over the past 30 years, as foods have become more convenient, more processed, we've gotten fatter and sicker. Poor lifestyle choices are often at the root cause of these chronic diseases. As you can see from this slide, the MMWR, which comes out of our government Center for Disease Control and Prevention, really out lays out here the preventable causes of the five leading causes of death from 2008 to 2009. As you can see, diet is implicated in four out of the ten causes of diseases. It is a major risk factor in half of our leading causes of death. It's actually killing us. Unfortunately, the connection between food and health has been ignored for way too long. I love to take credit for this concept as food is medicine, but it's nothing new. You see, in 431 BC, over 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. You fast forward to 1980s. 
The great Wendell Berry, farmer and environmentalist, once said, there is no connection between food and health. People are fed by a food industry which pays no attention to health and are healed by a health industry which pays no attention to food. Well, Mr. Berry, until now. So you see, I had this idea. As we know, prevention is more powerful than any drug or surgery. But it's difficult when our medical education system is not teaching our doctors about health, let alone nutrition, let alone food. Doctors can't prescribe what we're not taught. So for the, fa for the past 10 years, I've actually been prescribing food. As you can see, these are three prescriptions from my office here in Manhattan at Lenox Hill Hospital where I've actually been prescribing food, exercise, and meditation. This led me to another idea. What if we get all the players involved who feeds us? As you can see from this slide here, doctors, nurses, and physical uh, physician's assistants diagnose, treat, and manage diseases. Chefs feed the public. Farmers grow our food. Policymakers advise, questionably, the food industry. But rarely, however, do all partner up to diminish rates of obesity and, diet and diseases related to dietary and lifestyle choices. So you can see here, if you put food in the middle and you put all the players around, and if we get them all at the table, we can actually make a difference. See, when I went to medical school roughly 15 years ago, the amount of time we got on exercise, diet, and nutrition, and food was literally zero. Sadly, as you can see from these headlines, most recently, 2014, this really hasn't changed. As physicians, I believe we must put on our aprons, step up to the stove, and teach ourselves how to prepare and prescribe whole food, plant-based diets to our patients. Then this study came out in 2004, which kind of changed the way I thought about things. So as role models, physicians' health and patient care. For physicians, practicing a healthy behavior, oneself, was one of the most consistent and powerful predictors of them counseling their patients about healthy behaviors. As you can see, doctors, more doctors smoke camels than the 1950s. You know what? We put down our cigarettes, and now we must help our patients with our food. This led me to another idea. Cooking with doctors. And that's what we did. In 2010, we launched Fair Wellness. I've incorporated into our residency program, as you can see here, these are all doctors in training, a culinary medicine course where chefs in the kitchen, teach doctors how to cook. Our fair is always on Monday, always at the Natural Gourmet Institute, and always vegetarian. Decades of research has shown that the more plants we eat, the longer we live. It's that simple. In fact, our 2015 dietary guidelines also suggest it. The goals of these cooking classes are to make healthy, plant-based foods accessible to doctors, and through culinary and nutritional education, have them prepared to discuss these food-related choices with their patients. Thus far, we've taught over 150 residents how to cook, and our next class is in November. This is me leading a class here. And in fact, this past spring, to my surprise, we made it. We made the carousel of the top 80 stories on Yahoo's front page. And this is a screenshot of that special day in my life. So one of the coolest things we've done as well is actually we started to change how our hospital feeds our patients. As I told you before, we're part of a larger healthcare system called North Shore LIJ, which spans from eastern Long Island to Westchester to Manhattan and to Staten Island. And what we've done here is with the help of our chef instructor, Dr. Chef LaMarita at the Natural Gourmet Institute and Michael Kiley from North Shore LIJ, we began collaborating with our hospital chefs. We posted three cooking classes that provide an opportunity for these chefs and cooks to prepare and taste a wide variety of plant-based dishes. I simply believe that improving our hospital food is good medicine and the right medicine. We have two classes set up at the Natural Gourmet this spring. I'm sorry, this fall. And one of the things that this led to was this. This is the first ever continuing, continuing medical education program seminar 
for doctors. What's funny here is that 15 people were signed up, and as you can see from the picture on, on the lower side here, it was standing room only, and we had over 30 doctors come to learn how to cook and advise their patients on the importance of cooking and eating healthfully. You know, gardens have a long history in healthcare. As you can see from this, May 1943 in New York, children of the New York City Children's Aid Society work on their Victory Gardens at the West Side Center. So I started digging into how these rooftop gardens started. As you can see here, this is actually an, a message about food from the President of the United States during World War II, Harry Truman. I call upon every American to help increase nation's food supply. So what happened during the World War II time that industrial farms had to start siphoning off their foods and fruits and vegetables off to our military in Europe. So therefore, the U.S. government made a contribution to anyone that wanted to plant their own victory garden. And the tag here is that our, our food is fighting. So what we did is actually grow our own victory gardens. And it was an initiative to support the war effort. People throughout the United States grew their own produce in yards, parks, and other community spaces so that all available resources could go towards the war effort. Ladies and gentlemen, today I think we're fighting a different kind of war, a different kind of battle, the battle against obesity, food insecurity, and the health of communities. But finding an abandoned location, a rooftop, especially in New York, can be a tall order, given our limited space. Fortunately, this view right here was part of my daily trip from one part of the hospital to another. So, which led me to another idea. In the past three years, we've turned this barren rooftop into this. And we all heard of farm to table, but how about rooftop to bedside? As you can see here, this is our chef clipping some basil in order to make some rooftop basil pizza. And today, I can share with you these two emails. These are emails from our chef, and check out what we're cooking this week. As you can see from the bottom one here, we're using the rooftop herbs on a daily basis, Monday through Friday. Tomorrow, basil oregano for our tomato basil bisque and our sauce for our chicken parmesan. Wednesday, fresh, che, fresh sage. On Thursday, fresh mint and zucchini. On Friday, thyme in their clam chowder and also lemon basil for their seafood bake. So cool, finally we're making a change. Thank you so much to the new chef and food manager. Our grand opening of Victory Greens was a huge success. We catered for 100 people. Over 300 people have come to visit the garden. And due to everyone's help over the past year, thousands of staff members have visited the garden. We've turned an abandoned rooftop into a beautiful space that nourishes the mind, the body, and the soul of our staff. As you can see here, some rocking chairs. This was my wife's idea in order to offer our staff a place so they can reflect and refresh in order to go back to work. Some of the pictures of our herbs that we grow on our, on our rooftop. This is a picture of our catnip, a lemon verbena, basil, and oregano. Everyone's favorite strawberries, which really don't last. We grow chives, sage, parsley, Here's a better picture of our sage here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is sage here and some tarragon in, in the forefront. Our beautiful chard, which actually we use in our soups and our salads. And in fact, they are so big, they grow about roughly two feet tall. And everyone's favorite, summer sunflowers. As you can see here, this is my wife taking a picture with our sunflowers. Our garden is organic and respectful of bio biodiversity. And in fact, this is one of the coolest things we do. We host, as you can see me in the forefront here, I host botanical medicine rounds with both medical students and our residents to teach them where most of our medications today come from, which in fact 80% of our current medications from, come from plant-based sources. And this is probably one of the most fun days we have. 
This is what we call a garden snip party. It's held up on Victory Green's rooftop. As you can see here is a hashtag. And what we do is invite everyone in a hospital to take some of the herbs and vegetables home and cook with them and then post it on our hashtag Victory Greens. And what we started doing this year, as you can see here in this slide, we actually have wellness rounds where we have lectures and patient rounds on our rooftop. We donate our harvest last year to some of our favorite restaurants. Here on the left, you can see the owners of Candle Cafe, which is a vegan restaurant here on Upper East Side, where they actually has taken some of the herbs back into their kitchen. And finally, we see a picture of both me and our farmer, Dr. Farmer Kristen, donating the rest of our bounty at the end of the year to City Harvest. And this is one of their kitchens. Incredibly, our initiatives have appeared on just about every single media outlet. This is one picture of me on the Today Show with Pat Battle. And most recently, just last week, we made Edible Manhattan. And Mind Body Green just came and saw us last week. So what I'd like to share with you all here is my belief. Imagine someday we have a sustainable hospital-based farm that we feed all of our hospitals, rehab centers, medical schools, etc. Well, just last week, due to the collaboration between Rodale Institute and St. Luke's Hospital in Bethlehem, New Jersey, maybe the future is here. I love the title of this. Our hospital farm is the next big thing in healthcare. So, allow me to plant the seed of an idea. Why can't our hospitals and clinics provide healthy food and be places of wellness, healing, and care? Why can't they have the freshest and healthiest cafeterias, best gyms, and delicious patients' food menus? Why can't they have healing gardens and farms in addition to, most, to the most modern emergency rooms, IT systems, and operating rooms? After all, it's called hospitality. I believe the time is urgent. It is us to leave a legacy. We can change the way we eat by dem demanding more from our food and healthcare systems. As I shared with you in the beginning of my talk here, I believe we're all sick and tired of being sick and tired. Our roots are weak. My work in the clinic, in the classroom, the kitchen, and in the garden is my homage to my past, my roots. Let this be the time future generations say that our doctors, chefs, farmers, and policymakers finally got it right. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay grounded and may your roots run deep and healthy and your leaves be fruitful, as you can see on this beautiful tree. So if you're ever in New York, and I welcome you all to come and visit our garden. And if you can't, Catch my TED Talk, which I really, TEDx Manhattan Talk, which I had the privilege of speaking alongside Danielle that day. And if you can't do that, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram on a hashtag, Fair Wellness, F-A-R-E-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S. -S. Really appreciate your attention. And at this time, I bid you fair wellness and I'm open to any questions or suggestions. Questions. Thank you so Thank much you for coming. So Thank you, Dr. Graham. That was great and a really informative presentation. Uh, and I'd just like to take this time to remind our listeners to continue to send in their questions using the chat box, Twitter with hashtag food tank, or email them to me, Sarah, at foodtank.com. So for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, we'll go through as many questions as possible. Uh, and Dr. Graham, I'd like to start by asking you this one. What are some of the biggest challenges you face in seeking to integrate traditional medicine into our modern healthcare system? Have you experienced pushback from the field? And how have you overcome some of these obstacles? Oh, it's a, it's a great question, one I get asked often. Um, well, this whole issue of the nomenclature is interesting. You mentioned traditional medicine. So what is traditional medicine? Is traditional medicine the stuff that was used or what we currently use today? And I would argue that traditional mes medicine is the complementary, integrative, and alternative aspects of modern healthcare today. So one of the challenges that we have as a field of integrative medicine 
was that we have not done the appropriate research that I believe is needed to push the field along. But one thing that has, I believe, will push the field along is that this past November, um, I was fortunate enough to be one out of 97 doctors who are board certified in integrative medicine by the American uh, Academy of Physician Specialties. So we're on the same playing field as gastroenterologists, cardiologists, endocrinologists, etc. And so I think having board certified physicians allowing us the opportunity to call ourselves board certified will move this agenda and allow for more of an acceptance of integrated medicine into our current current medical healthcare system. Additionally, I think the other thing that needs to be done is that we have to show research in terms of what we do has to be proven. Um, not by large randomized control trials because those are very difficult to do, but I think that if we start delving into the area of evidence-based medicine, I think that will push our agenda further. Great, thank you, Dr. Graham. Uh, and the next question uh, reads, uh, where do you see the greatest overlap between traditional, um, as you define it, traditional medicine and modern scientific approaches, and how does food connect these seemingly uh, disparate areas of knowledge? Um, maybe can you talk a little bit more about how you characterize food as medicine and how uh, this concept and, and the idea of prescribing fruits and veggies fits into other areas of medicine as well? Yeah, so I think yeah, so I most... It's a, it's a great question again. Um, the greatest, I think, collaborative nature of what traditional medicine does and Western medicine does. Let me take a step back. If you look at every single clinical guideline for, for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high cholesterol, um, gastrointestinal diseases, all guidelines start off by saying that patients should be adopting a healthy lifestyle, which I consider eating you know, your servings of five to nine fruits and vegetables a day, exercising 150 minutes a week, and managing your stress. I think those three areas of eating well, moving, and some sort of stress reduction program that you have for yourself should be incorporated into every single health encounter. It's a fresh model. It's looking at it differently. And if I can share with you my model, it's called Fresh. And I started with food. I just can't believe that in today's world, we still don't ask our patients and inquire um, in our history intake, what are we eating? What are our patients eating? And I think that probably has the greatest impact um, beyond movement and maybe uh, stress reduction into our own health. And I think it's a simple way of, of, of engaging the patient in talking about their um, medical illnesses by touching upon food. And if you look at all traditional healthcare systems, from the traditional Chinese medical system, from Ayurveda, from Latin America, from Israeli medicine, any type of traditional medical system, food is medicine and medicine is food. Um, you know, and I, and I, I think we've lost our way. And I think there's great disservice that we've done in today's modern medicine world where we focus so much on modern technology and we've abandoned the ancient wisdom of our elders in how we eat and take care of each other. Great, thank you again. Uh, and the next question, uh, actually we've had a several questions from, from listeners uh, regarding how much of the food in the Victory Garden makes up a patient's meal and, and how can we uh, expand that to be even a, a greater part of uh, the, the hospital patient's meal. And then also maybe you could discuss about the, the recent partnership with Rodale uh, and, and that farm and how just all over the country uh, in the world we might be able to expand partnerships like this to start to, to provide closer towards 100% of the food um, in hospitals from farms just like the ones that you've created from Victory Greens. Yeah, so that's 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 my next that's the next that's the next big step that we have to do. So, obviously, as you can see some, from some of the pictures, we use planters, you know, raised beds and planters, um, where obviously it limits our ability to feed masses of people. So what we're currently doing now is offering our staff and our patients that come into our cafeteria the ability to sample some of our herbs and vegetables. 
my dream is to actually, like Rodale, uh, Rodale and St. Luke's, is to develop a farm, um, or at least some sort of rooftop farm that is able to produce at a mass scale. Um, you know, things like these, all it takes is someone with an idea, some money, and the chutzpah to do it. And oftentimes I get people coming up and saying, I should, I, you should do this, Dr. Graham, you should do this. And I encourage people to, they should start helping me um, do something small. What we did on Rictory Greens has been an incredible um, success for, I think, the hospital, but more importantly for our patients. Um, this connection, and our staff, and this connection between understanding where our food comes from seeing it and taking it home and cooking with them has just been an incredible learning experience for all of us. Uh, my dream is that we have six rooftops here at Lenox Hill Hospital and each of them should be able to uh, manufacture food that we actually can put onto every single bed in our hospital. Um, obviously in New York we were challenged by space um, but as I said, North Shore LIJ has a huge um, presence here in New York, and I hope to, similarly to what they did in Pennsylvania, is to develop a hospital-based farm that we can actually start feeding our patients healthy, nutritious, local, um, organic foods that don't need to be, you know, shipped from too far distances so that they can uh, land on our patients' bedsides. Great, thank you. Uh, and the next question kind of expands on that. So when uh, people are interested in starting these, these rooftop farms or hospital gardens, um, how can we also work with farmers, local farmers in the area to make them more successful? Uh, and then more specifically, how did you make this uh, Victory Green successful? And more specifically, um, via funding and any sort of barriers or pushback you had to come overcome? So. You know, it's, it's, it's a common question I get as well. Um, three things. I think you need someone to um, push this agenda. Um, I, happen to be, I happen to be a physician. Um, for me, it worked. Someone has to have an idea. And obviously, you need some seed money. Um, and I've been very candid about this. The, that Victory Greens, the initial startup funds, to build the planters and um, and get the dirt and everything else, including the farmer, cost about twenty thousand um, dollars. And I would argue that the press that has the hospital and the health system has achieved from being a model of I think healthy eating, at least in New York City, has really been you know embraced by our leadership and our administration and in fact this year they've funded entirely um, so it takes some money not that much an idea and a person to lead the cause um, so that's my that, that that's the way I I approached it um, and I really didn't have that much resistance because if you have an idea and you have some money behind you things happen um, so that's one. That's your first question. Second question: How we can get local farmers involved? I think that's a great opportunity and a missed opportunity that many hospitals have um, not not acted upon. You know, again, one of the challenges that we have in New York. I would love to have a CSA. I would love to have local farmers drop off things, but due to the cost and nature of Manhattan, particularly New York City, it just comes becomes cost prohibitive for our local farmers to be delivering food to our hospital. Number two, there's really no place to store them. And that's really the, one of the challenges that we have here in New York. I would say that if you're not in an, an urban city like Manhattan or any other large industrial urban city, that you probably have the opportunity to partner up with local farms. Um, I love the idea of farmers webs. I love the idea of you know central places where local farmers can drop off their produce and one truck comes in to uh, a city, but again, it's challenging giving our space and time uh, coming in, a, in and out of an, an urban city is just really challenging. Thanks, Dr. Graham. Uh, and the next question starts to, to dive into your reach, so both with your patients and with other hospitals. So are your patients taking some of these lessons home and starting their own gardens maybe after being served uh, fresh produce or buying fresh, press, 
fresh produce on their own. And then also, you know, it's such a great program, this roof tied to rooftop to bedside uh, table. And so are any other hospitals asking for your uh, consultation or advice? Great questions. Um, so number one, so why do we do things? I do it. I do things to hopefully improve people's lives. And so I give you a, a personal anecdote here. My parents live here in Queens. Um, and in fact, after coming to see our garden, they went home and started developing their own roof, their own um, planter mini garden. And, um, and I've had a couple of patients also do the similar things here. And what I found out is that, A, number one, patients are eating more fruits and vegetables um, and, and, and eating more herbs. Number one reason why is that if they grow it, if they plant it and they grow it, they want to eat it and they do not want to throw it away. So instead of throwing it away in the trash, they're throwing it down their mouths. So that's been a huge, you know, direct link between what we do on the garden um, and enticing people to grow their own vegetables. Similar to the Victory Gardens of World War II. Number two, um, the other thing we've done is actually we started inviting um, patients into our culinary program. So this is something that I would love to get more funding to do as well is to develop teaching kitchens. So we're actually, instead of taking doctors into a culinary school where um, they learn how to cook, what I love to do is develop a teaching kitchen within our clinical settings so that therefore doctors and patients can work side by side to make a healthy meal. And that's been a huge success. I have not had, I've been doing it for five years, twice a year. Um, due to this class size of my cooking program, I could only invite um, 13 participants, and each year, uh, twice a year, we have over 25 people applying for it. And um, I would love to have the ability to offer more culinary classes for our patients. Um, you know, if, if as a physician, you know, if we ask our patients very simply, do you think how you eat, what you eat, and why you eat affects your health? It's a great way, an open-ended way of introducing patients to this conversation about food. And, you know, this is where research needs to happen. I would love to start, you know, testing my hypothesis that if we talk more about food and we actually cook more, we're actually able to actually decrease the incidence of uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, um, and obesity in our society. So um, I would love the opportunity to study what we're doing here. Now, the last question you asked me is about are other hospitals taking note? So I would have, I would be, I'm fortunate enough to work within a, a large healthcare system of 19 hospitals. And I'll share with you some of the things that have come out of this collaboration uh, with our chefs. So we've developed two farmer's markets out on Long Island. We've actually um, two gardens um, where two other hospitals are now developing gardens. Three other hospitals are interested in developing um, their gardens. We're the only rooftop one because we're the only one in Manhattan. Um, other hospital systems in the United States have come and visited our rooftop garden, um, which tells me that this movement is occurring uh, both locally, nationally, and I hope soon to be globally. Um, it's been a very exciting time and again, as I said to you before, if anyone is in New York and wants to see what we've done here, um, you're all welcome to come and visit our garden. And if you're in here in the fall, you know, you can reach me, message me via social media, uh, Fair Wellness. And if you're in town, come and witness what we do with our chefs and with our doctors. Thank you, Dr. Graham. And that culinary program sounds amazing. Um, so the next question is, how can other medical professionals contribute to not only patient well-being through food, but also to creating a better food system that benefits farmers and consumers outside of the healthcare system? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? Of course. Yep. How can other medical professionals contribute not only to patient well-being through food, but also to creating a better food system that benefits farmers and consumers outside of the healthcare system as well? Uh, great question again. Um, I like to paraphrase Nike's quote, just do it. Um, start small. Um, if there's any other healthcare professionals on, on, on right now, um, just start small. Do it in your own practice. 
have the discussion uh, with our patients about integrative therapies, and particularly food, uh, exercise, and uh, stress reduction. Ask them what they're eating, why they're eating, how they're eating it. Um, many times uh, there's just this disconnect uh, between um, a pharmaceutical-driven medical system and giving another pill. Um, and I think that, you know, focusing on patients' lifestyles is the next movement in healthcare. Um, I've got the great fortune of speaking at the Lifestyle Medicine Conference this fall where the attendance has grown exponentially each year. So what I would urge everyone to do is just start having a real discussion about food and lifestyle with our patients. Um, and you said something, another question. The second question, the second part of that question was? Sorry, my volume was off. Uh, Dr. Graham, the other part of the question was how can um, we also to create, how can we contribute to creating a better food system that benefits farmers and consumers outside of the healthcare system as well? Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's a million dollar question. And as I stated in my closing comments, I think as consumers, we vote with our forks and our feet. And I think we have to start demanding more from our food, our and healthcare systems, um, particularly our farmers and chefs. Um, I think the Meatless Monday movement is a great movement. Um, you know, many restaurants' slowest nights are on Monday, and through the help of, um, through the the brilliance of, I think, uh, Sid Lerner and the Meatless Monday and the Monday campaigns, actually, chefs now, at least in New York City, I can tell you, is that they actually feature Meatless Monday uh, menus. Um, on Mondays where their volume is lowest and it's actually increased um, the demand on for meatless Monday for meatless uh, options on Mondays um, and I think we have a, a, an incredible movement that is occurring in our food system but it really is at the grassroots and I think we as a society have to demand more um, and again we vote with our forks and our feet and we should stop buying things that are not healthy for us we should stop we should stop going to restaurants and other food purveyors that are not providing healthy, sustainable food for um, our society. And I think we have great power in, in our movement. Uh, we just need to continue doing it. Great. Thank you. Uh, and we'll have room or time for about one or two more questions. So the next one, um, you spoke about the, the doctors being removed from food as medicine and kind of the lack of nutrition or culinary training in, in medical school. Um, so why do you think that, that that connection has been ignored in the past? And also, do you think that new and young doctors are becoming more interested in food and kind of uh, piecing together this gap? Oh, boy, if I had the answer to that. Um, lack of training, I have no idea. Um, I've looked into the literature, 1960. Um, the U.S. Surgeon General demanded that our medical education system bring in nutrition into our curriculum. Now, let me start by saying that we teach nutrition in a very um, disparate way. We teach things from the micro and macro level in medical school. I think what we have to start doing is putting it first um, and teaching about food, how to talk to our patients about food. Um, but I think there's change, positive things are occurring. And I'd like to highlight a couple of them nationally. Um, so in the past, say, three years, um, one of the greatest things that I've come uh, to collaborate with is uh, Tulane Medical School has a Gold Ring Center for Culinary Medicine uh, led by Tim Harlan. And what they're doing is actually bringing culinary medicine into their medical school training. The greatest one of the best initiatives I've heard. A um, couple weeks ago, University of Chicago uh, emailed me about introducing their culinary medicine program at their medical school as well. Uh, last but not least, um, my mentor, David Eisenberg for Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health, partnered up with the CIA to develop Healthy Kitchen, Healthy Lives back in 2008, I believe. I had the great fortune of working with Dr. Eisenberg um, during my fellowship at Harvard. And it's been a huge success for the last, I think, six, seven years where they train doctors. Similar to what I do, I teach them about the importance of food as medicine, but equally importantly, if not more importantly, it's the experiential part of taking them into a kitchen and teaching them how to cook. 
as I shared with you before, Erica's Frank study on you know one doctor's health behavior being the most powerful predictor of teaching their patients about a healthy behavior. I think that's really the model. You know, this whole see one, do one, teach one model of medical school is really, I believe, is the next frontier. And the last point, I think, you know, it gives me great hope that our young trainees all understand and have this conversation of integrated medicine. Acupuncture is not a weird thing for them. They all understand the issues behind organics. They understand the importance of a work-life balance. So I think there's great hope for the future, particularly in healthcare, that, healthcare uh, that future generations of doctors, nurses, and physical uh, physician assistants have this understanding before they enter medical school. And we'll start demanding more. And as we're seeing, culinary medicine pop up throughout the country. Uh, so I think it's an exciting time. Thank you, Dr. Graham, and I, I think you answered a little bit of my last question actually just now, but I'll ask you and you can add any additional points that you want to end on as well. Uh, so it's a, it's a big question. Are you optimistic about the future of nutrition and overall being in the United States, and how do you see the field changing over time? Uh, can other example, or can you give our audience any other examples of farm to bedside uh, programs around the country or world as well? Um, I have to be excited um, about what I'm doing or else I wouldn't be able to get up in the morning. Um, I think the movement of integrative medicine focusing on particularly the three pillars of healthcare, uh, which have been ignored, again, food, movement, and um, stress reduction, um, also including social support and this pursuit of happiness. I think that is the new frontier of healthcare. Um, as I said to be before, um, institutions like the Lifestyle Medicine Program, um, having a board certification in integrated medicine is again moving the field where it should have been probably 30 years ago. But more importantly than anything, I think our patients and our society in general have to want more and demand more. Um, you know, it's an economic model. Um, if we actually do better, we will get better. And I think that is where the um, the hope for a better future lies through collaboration between our doctors, our patients, our chefs, our farmers, and policymakers. There has to be a better tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Graham. That was a really inspiring talk and really informative as well. Um, it's really interesting to hear all the programming that you're working on, and I hope that our listeners were able to gain something from that today and be able to take that into their own lives and local communities as well. So thank you again. It was truly a pleasure to have you, and thank you to all of our listeners for sending in their questions to create this interactive discussion. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be posted later today on foodtank.com and Food Tank's YouTube page if you'd like to listen again. Um, but for now, thank you to everyone, and have a great rest of your day.